Welcome to SawCast number 15. Today, we are honored to have with us a guest that I've known for a short 54 years. Ron Owens and I went through training group together in 1967, A Company at the Special Forces Training Group. He joins us today to talk not only about our time together in training group, which I think we'll minimize, but our time in SOG together and the different aspects of life and then the fascinating uh, time thereafter. Ron, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it. Amen. Airborne. All right. <laughs> All the way. Indeed. So uh, for uh, our listening audience, uh, I want to say we go into podcast number 15, courtesy of Jocko Willink Productions, and we thank him for helping us to do all this and to move forward and to capture our history, of which you are a vital part, sir. Thank you. Can't wait to meet him. Indeed. Monday, oh, he'll be here. All right. And airborne. Mm-hmm. So, um, again, uh, I arrived at A Company, um, 1967 May, after jump school. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you rolled in the A Company. We were together there with Spider Parks, Rick Howard, a few other. Yes, Art uh, Driscoll. Art Driscoll, that's right. And the Frenchman rolled in there about the same time. He was a little bit later, I think. Well, a little but, bit, but a little bit. But yeah. anyway, he was on a good team. Exactly. And then, um, so we met there, and then um, we, at the end of our training, we had the FTX. Yep. And uh, that was December, so a, failed, a field training exercise, they called it, which is yes. the final phase. Yes. I don't think they called it. We didn't call it Robin Sage then. No, it was called Butler Woods, I think. Is that right? Gobbler Woods. God, that's it. Gobbler Woods. Yeah. So FTX is the final training where after everybody does their MOS training, yes. you all come together as an A team. You jump into a target at night. In our case, we jumped at night in the rain at 500 feet. Wow. Which was the first... And then we landed, and of course we had some of our brothers. We had Jim Mitchell had a broken leg. We yes. heard him screaming in the trees, yeah. and another guy had a broken back. I forget who that was. Uh-huh. But that was our operational training. Then we went TDY before we landed in Vietnam. Yeah. And then from there, sir, after that FTX, and whereupon we earned our Green Berets. Yes, sir. What happened to you after that point? Because that's where we diverged, yes. and then we came together again in Vietnam like magic. Well, I heard they were shooting at people over there, so I, I, <laughs> I promptly got assigned to the 7th group. <laughs> and during that period, yeah. I still didn't fully understand where I was heading or what I was about to get into. Indeed. But, None of uh, us did. I know. There was a sergeant major back in those days by the name of T.J. Gray, and uh, he found out that I spoke a little bit of German, so Ooh. he said, where you need to go is to my Gabriel team. And I said, oh, okay, what's and a Gabriel team? <laughs> very good. <laughs> so I did, and I spent about six well, tell, months. Tell our listening audience yes. what the Gabriel team was. Well, the Gabriel team was a demonstration team uh, that demonstrated what the capabilities of a ODA, Operation of Detachment Alpha, could do. A 12-man A team. The 12-man A team had two officers and 10 enlisted uh, at that time. And what they did was that they demonstrated each of the MOSs, the Military Occupation Specialties. Uh, They would demonstrate that not only in English, but they would demonstrate it in a chosen language that they were proficient in. And so uh, my little skit took all of about 30 seconds, about the extent of my German, too. (laughs) But they, uh, they they would sit there and the people would come through. There would be congressmen, there would be important people who were coming in, and they were seeing where the funding would go for this new stand-up organization called Green Berets. And also, let me interrupt you for a second. Mm-hmm. The most famous Gabriel team demonstration, which was back in 61 or 62, yes, with um, our general meeting with JFK. Yes. And after that meeting, JFK designated by executive order the official rearing of the Green Beret, which... Yeah. Before that, the regular army had opposed. Yes. But JFK, who we loved and respect ever since, regardless of any politics, yes. was our president. He yes. gave us the honor. So move on to that Gabriel team. He saw the demonstration, was impressed, yep. and General Yarborough said, hey, by the way, when you go back, could you make this official? And he did. Yeah. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but go no, ahead. No, that's, that, that's good. <laughs> it's a good reminder. It jogs my memory, too. Indeed. But I, I, I finished that, and then, of course, Mrs. Alexander uh, wasn't going to have anything of me staying back there, being on a demonstration team, when all of you guys had already beat me over there. 
So I ended up uh, coming over in August uh, to Vietnam, uh, and I went to... Uh, and just for our listeners, yes. this is the first time they've ever listened to a SOG cast. Mrs. Billy Alexander worked in the Pentagon, and her, one of her sole jobs was assigning Green Berets, young in nature like yourself, to... Yes, Vietnam. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> she is, to me, the godmother. Indeed. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And she was beautiful on top Oh, my of gosh, a lovely lady. Lovely. Absolutely. Yeah. One of our saints. Yes, exactly. So you go down, Billy gets you there. Yeah, uh, I got me there. I flew into Cameron Bay. I thought it was very scenic. And then when the heat hit and I got off that plane, uh, that oh. changed my attitude pretty quick. You Did you feel like you had to cut through the humidity as you yes, exited the plane? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Indeed. Yes, uh, they should have never air conditioned that cabin. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> we got off, and uh, we spent about one night there. Uh, all of a sudden, somebody showed up in the sterile uniform and said, "You're coming with us to a place called Nha Trang," and I said, "Okay." And so we went to Nha Trang. Uh, we checked in there, and they were waiting on us to to go to a combat orientation course. Uh, and the train was the 5th Special Forces Group headquarters at that time. That is correct. And this is August 1968. That is correct. The, and is that near the middle of August or the early part? Before, then you had to do your in-country training before things got dicey. Uh, no, no, well, we, we from there we went straight to a set of holding barracks. Our barracks were directly next to the Rocondo Company. And uh, so they had <clears> did <throat> some interviews. They did, some, uh, they did our physicals. They checked us in. And they gave us some miraculous little guns. The <laughs> I forget what they were. They were World War Two, I think, or maybe one. The carbines. Uh, the carbines. Yes. 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 That's that's it. <laughs> Being a weapons man, I should have remembered that, shouldn't I? But uh, anyway, we had, they gave us carbines, and we did guard duty. We did uh, uh, different types of assignments that they would give us, and then of course. Uh, a few days later, we would go down and we would go to a place called Hontre Island, as, as which we did the COC course. Right. And uh, so when I got to Hontre Island, uh, I was assigned to a bunch of guys, and we all picked out little miniature teams that we were on. And then the excitement began because then they ran us down these jungle trails with pop-up targets and out of trees and on the ground. And uh, evidently, I must have done pretty well because... The instructor came up to me and said, your next assignment is Rakondo School. And I said, great. I said, uh, not knowing what Rakondo School was. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> uh, he said, yes, that's what's going to happen. And he says, and as soon as you get in here, unbeknownst to me, I did not know what had happened at the camp. Right. Uh, this and is August, around August 23rd, 1968. Just, I was there, just, I was about August Fifteenth. Well, the actual attack was the twenty third. But exactly. this is, you're, you're there before the attack. I was. I was. Yes, but I was in the train. But yes, I was sir. not at the at the camp. And so, what ended up happening then is that the, we finished up this, the the course, and they said, "Okay, this is what it is." And they said, "All right, Owens, this, this is where you're going to go." Uh, and we said, "Where's that?" And he said, "Well, we can't really tell you just yet. We have to make sure that your security clearance is okay." <laughs> I know I didn't know I have to have security clearance, but I, but I do, yeah. and so, and so we were there for like two days, and in the meantime, we would fall out in the morning to do PT with the Ricondo company uh, yeah. guys, and there was I, it was really confusing because I didn't understand. I thought it was American, but there was all these Koreans that were there with us. Really? Oh man, the, the rocks. They were hard as rocks too. Yeah, well, absolutely. And they were I mean, they would do put if they saw you doing a push up, they'd do six more than what you would do. And this is Every the Royal single. Army or Royal Order of Korea. Yes. The Rock. It, the Rock. Oh my god, those guys were amazing. Unbelievable. And so we did that and then uh they called us about August twenty fourth or twenty fifth. And said, "This is your class date. This is when you're going to be, you know, be starting." The very next day, they came in and and pulled the guys that they had selected that thought would could run the jungle trail out on the island pretty well, mm -hmm. and said, "We need to know if you'd like to go to okay, a place called FOB4." <laughs> and I said, mm, "Sure, why not?" And they said, "Well, they just took some major casualties, and they need help now." Not yesterday, but now. And I said, okay. 
And they said, all right. I said, well, go out and grab your rucksack because it's already packed for you. They had already made that decision, evidently. Really? Took it, put me on a, on a Huey along with five or six other guys, and off we went. And we got into the camp. Uh, and just know, for the record, we're talking about FUB4, Danang. F- Danang, is, CCN. And this is uh, August 68. At the time, there were six FOBs and th- that were all part of the secret war. That's correct. FUB4, Danang was just north of Marble Mountain, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. But first, so you land at the helicopter pad yep. on that, what day was it? Do you remember? Because uh, the attack was uh, the morning of August 23rd. It was the, uh, the three days, four days, th- three or four days. Shortly thereafter. Okay, that's you right. Landed. Yeah, well, I landed. Indeed. And, and you know, when I got off, it was, it was, it was a, it was a, a surreal type of fe- feeling at the the place was very quiet where normally you would hear a lot of sounds and there, you would see uh, we didn't land at the at the helipad out on the end we actually landed down there was a B company uh, further oh, down, down, on, down the road right just down the road we landed there and a guy picked us up at a three-quarter ton with no markings black Indeed. Okay. <laughs> and we jumped in, and he said, hey, this, you need some weapons? I said, yeah. I said, well, here, take what you want. And he had a bunch of M16s and things like that. And so we took those, and we said, he said, and if we take any fire coming into this place, he said, just shoot. It says, I'll keep driving. You keep shooting. <laughs> so we drove down and came through the main gate and drove down past the helipad, pulled up out front of the headquarters, got out, and Sergeant Major Charlie Vickers. Oh, yeah. Charlie Vickers came up and <clears throat> said, okay, this is it. And he said, okay, I see this. And he said, are you men are ready? And he said, uh, okay. And he said, Owens. I said, yes, Sergeant Major. He said, I see that you're a medic. And I said, no, I'm just, I'm not even a half, I'm a half medic. <laughs> and that's another story. But he said, all right, well, never mind. He says, uh, I want you to go to the dispensary. And he said, just take you back. And I was going, ah, 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 you know, the type of thing, and stuttering. Yeah. Off I went over there. Then we had some guys who had been wounded in the attack. But in fairness to you, our listeners might go, Ron Owens, what is a half medic? I mean, I know the answer to that question, yeah, but yeah. please explain why this part of your unique history. Well, <laughs> the, the, my, actually, the, the MOS by the time I got to where you were at, yeah. you know, while I was up in FOP4, I was a uh, radio operator. But before that, I had went to, I uh, was a medic assigned to a medic school. Yeah. And back at Fort Bragg, up on Smoke Bomb Hill, so there's a, uh, a bunch of old World War II barracks. Next to that was where Womack Hospital was located. And so then it was uh, the 91 series, which is the medical series. They usually had a preface of a 4S at, uh, t- attached to the end of it. Right. And so what ended up happening there was that I went through the medical basic aidman's course on steroids okay it's the same thing if you get if you were 82nd medic sure. or but this one had the very on, first level of training very but again on steroids i finished that <laughs> i was getting ready to go to fort sam houston because that was the next place that you had to go to learn about your medications and sure. some 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 which is part of that time the medics course was about a year long at that time every, every bit yeah, yeah it's been, and it's still the best medic training in the world. Yes, to sir. Stay. Even so you were a part of that. Yeah, well, for a short time. For a short time. So when I, I got ready to go, <laughs> I know I had about another 24, maybe 48 hours. And then I got the word uh, that my wife uh, at that time had come down with pleurisy. And so I was out, I was actually kind of like an isolation type of thing, getting ready to go out there. So the Red Cross notified them. So then I said, pleurisy. Now, I'm a medic. I'm supposed to know what that means. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant, you know. Yeah. So they pulled me. They pulled me out of that training. And so I come to find out they had to put her in a – it's kind of an uh, exaggerated pneumonia type of uh, position. Right. And they put her in a full body cast so they could help control her breathing and things like that. So I said, okay. So I had a, about a two-week vacation, and I got old fast, and I was, you know, moping and groping and trying to get everything's done. And finally, her mother showed up to help take care of her. 
So I reported back out to training group and tried to find out if I could get into that class. And they said, no, you've already missed some critical the next components until yeah, yeah. the, the next cycle. Well, the next cycle wasn't going to be till like six months away. <laughs> and I just went off the deep end. I said, then I was sitting there ranting and raving at some young E3, E4, you know, sitting there with, and I said, <laughs> okay. Well, there was a guy named Paul Villarosa. Oh, Paul man. Villarosa walked by, and he was a Camo instructor. Instructor. Legendary. Legendary. Green Beret Camo oh, instructor. Oh, my God. Yes, Brad. yes, yes. What a guy. And we talked about him in earlier podcasts. Oh, did you? Good. We have, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yes. Unbelievable. And I've firsthand witnessed how good he was, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, he came up and he said, Owens, he said, are you going to sit there and cry all day, or do you want to go to training? I said, Training. <laughs> He reached over and told us, said, put that man in my, my combo class at 1300 a day. That was at 09. He said, now go find some place to, you know, catch a nap, get you something to eat, and be up there. I was, can do. I never looked back. Oh, my God. Yeah. No kidding. There it is. So that, that's my half medic story that led me to yeah, the end sure, of the of training. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so there you are. You arrive at FOB4. And at that point, you're a combo geek. I was a combo geek, but... Charlie Vickers needed a medic, and he, wherever he could get one, he's going to grab it. If you're a half medic. That's right, even if a half medic. <laughs> so I, he stuck me over into the dispensary, over by the mortar pit, by close to there. Sure. Yeah. So as I walk in, I look up, and there's the honor graduate of the class that we were in, George Bacon. George Washington Bacon III. That's him. That's the man. Oh, my God. Yeah. And he looks up, and he goes, Big O, what are you doing here? I said, I'm a half medic. He said, you're no damn medic. <laughs> I said, tell Charlie Vickers that. He said, <laughs> and then I told him the story. He said, well, here, grab his bedpan and grab this and do this. And so we shuffled around there for two or three days. And then that time we would go out and we'd help, you know, pull guard duty. And, and unbeknownst to me, George, I don't know where he came from. I think he came from Contum. And how he ended FOB1. up. FOB1. FOB1. Yeah. He came there, and I think he was there for something, but he got shot through the shoulder. And when yeah, he got there. The attack. Exactly. On August 23rd. Exactly. Yes, sir. Yeah. And came out of his armpit. And yeah. uh, so he said, Yo, I've, I've been wounded. And said, so we okay. So he said, Do you want to go run recon? I said, Anything to get me out of the dispensary. He said, Well, come on. So he went down. <laughs> he picked us out of hooch. He went and talked to whoever the commander was at that time. Colonel um, Warren. Yeah, well, Colonel Warren, that's right. He's and a CO. That's right. And yes, sir. Um, there was somebody else, that, some some captain or major, I think he had, he had talked Maybe to. Maybe there was a recon company captain. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, I forget yeah. who that was. Then. Yeah, I do too. Because I still at FOB1 when you're down there at FOB4. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. Sure. So, anyway, we ended up, and we got this, the team assignment. And then <laughs> the thing was is that everything was really busy. Uh, let me back up to the day I got into camp. There were things still smoking. Is that Buildings right? still smoking. Okay. Several days after the attack. Uh, yes, several days after the attack. Um, they had temporarily taken some, dug, dug some, some graves over by one of the crappers over towards where the things, just to put in some of the bodies until they could come and find out where they're going to do with them, you know, transfer them someplace, do an right. evaluation. So I said, okay. But anyway, I, I, I helped uh, do that. And then George Bacon <laughs> then started putting together a team. But the problem was is that they were all the teams that were, that were real active and were still really good. Uh, you, don't, you don't really jump in and, and they didn't, we call something called strap hangers. Sure. And we were looking, we were ready to go help. But they were busy with, and they'd have time to train, to get in, to, to blend in with what it is. And of course, they would look at me, okay, and they'd look at George, and he's kind of slender, you know, not as big shoulders, but slender. Yes, right. And uh, so George was still continuing, and so we pressed on right there. And it took a little time for us to get enough people together to to develop a team and start training, and. That's where we you are. Had to, you had to recruit some in ditch. Were they yards or Vietnamese? Uh, they were yards. Yeah. They were yards. And uh, they, there was some type of conflict. And uh, 
with trying to get the yards. If other, other teams wanted the yards. And so those guys had priority over this. Then the guy who had my recon team was Sidewinder. It, there was a team there was a team sergeant there already at that head time uh, head sidewinder and I, I apologize I, I, I know his name but I can't think of it that second he'll come back but he he was in the last days of rotating out and he was there when the camp got hit short timer short timer and so, another reason why you had a hard time getting Monte yards or any troops right was that from the attack, we had many indigenous, our indigenous personnel, as long with the 16 Green Berets that were killed that night, yeah. which is still a historic high in SF history. Yes. But our counterparts took worse casualties yes. coming to defend the camp. And so when you're trying to put together a team within a week mm-hmm. after that attack, mm-hmm. uh, finding good, trained indigenous troops was difficult. Because right. there's always a vetting process first. And then finding them and getting people that are going to stand up and work with you, so that was part of your challenge. That's it. As, uh, well, moving forward, sir, yeah. from RT Sidewinder. There you go. So where we were uh, with regards to training, George would leave and, again, maybe went back to Fubai. Fubai. He came and, up, yeah. Right, he might went back, but he came back up. And I was, I was just I was there by myself. <laughs> um, and George was fluent in a couple of languages. Uh, Brew and Rade, he had picked up almost like instantly. Well, and yeah, because when he came to Fubai, yeah. he picked these languages yes. up. Like you and I, we, we need an interpreter. Yeah. But Phenomenal. George was so brilliant. Oh, he was. He was smart. Oh. Yeah, very good. But he, anyway, then I became ad hoc with our team. Sure. And we would try to do so. Uh, when, it, when some teams, they didn't really run too many things, but, the, but when they did, they ran them primarily out of Fubai and Quan Tri. Right. Uh, and so they, if they needed something like Bright Light or something, they would take some of the experienced guys, so then they'd fly them up to there. Well, I did have the opportunity to get on part of a stand-up Bright Light team and went up to Fubai and, and stood by for a couple of days, and it wasn't necessary. We didn't have to. They, they somehow got... Charlie Green's in to get the team out and flew them back to Fuba or back to wherever they flew sure. them to. Might have been NKP, I'm not sure. But at any rate, they, I came back, and when I came back, uh, that was in with the first, about the middle of September, and then we still were trying to find George had came back, so we started putting together a team, and he had some guys that that he had set up. I don't, I don't know exactly where he got them, but I didn't really care. I was just glad to see him. Yeah. And so we did our first mission was up on Monkey Mountain. And so we did our training mission up there. And uh, the, there, was, uh, there was the usual stories about monkeys attacking and things like that. I could hear them shaking the trees at night, for that's for sure. Well, did you ever have that? Well, that's also the experience where you're in the jungle – yeah. You hear th- something coming towards you, and your yeah. first reaction is right. Viet Cong NBA because this is Monkey Mountain, which is just north of of uh, FOB four, yes. off into the China Sea yes. training ground. That and many of our teams had contact there, and we had people get wounded in a couple KIAs during yes. that quote training. Yes. So there you are, yep. and you can hear something coming towards you. And your right. first reaction. Mm-hmm. Oh shit! The yeah. pucker factor's tight. The pins are out of hand grenade, and yeah. you're attacked by uh, monkeys. Monkeys, <laughs> big, <laughs> evil, mean, uh, spitting monkeys. Oh, they're spitting oh, yeah. at you. Oh on yeah, top yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. You could hear them. They were making all kinds of sounds. Obviously, the Viet Cong, Viet Cong monkeys. I, I they think so. It. Yeah, indeed. I think they've been recruited. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but we we got up and we moved. Uh, we moved a couple clicks the next day. And they said, okay, that's enough of that. So they exfilled us out, and then we came back. And then the next uh, mission that I got a chance to run was another training mission, and it was up near Haiphong Pass. And there were some roads and stuff that went back in there, and they were trying to figure out if, if there was any movement that was up in that area. Somebody had reported it. So we went up there, and we stayed for three days, and uh, we watched some um, – uh, there was a movie out called Air America. 
if you ever saw that movie or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, where they flew one of those planes and landed up beside of a mountain, I actually saw something like that happen. No. Yeah, they flew it in, flew it up, and it went straight up a mountain. It stopped. Some guys ran out of the thing, grabbed it, and tied tied off the tail. Uh, the, the last little hook there? The hook. Yeah. And then this guy gave it left <clears throat> rudder, right rudder, spun the plane around, and they still held it while they offloaded uh, the supplies on the other side. Now, I, to this day, I don't know who that was, <laughs> but I saw <laughs> Holy smokes. And I said, George, should we report that? And he said, no, I don't think we should report that. I said, okay. <laughs> but uh, they, were, they were there. So that, that was, that was, that was uh, the, my second. And then the third one, we went back to Monkey Mountain. Uh, and then a couple uh, of short ones as we got into October, we came in with a guy named Sanderfield Allen Jones, Sandman. Sandy, Sandy came in. And he was the one two. I was the one one, and George obviously was the one zero. And we had picked up two more uh, indigenous. And I, I want to say that they were Vietnamese, which I found to be odd, uh, yeah. working directly with mountain yards. Sure. And so that was just my impression. Uh, we would sometimes go over to where the longhouses were and they would have food and we would sit and try to eat with them. Uh, but they they very rarely ever came over to where we were at in the recon company. Right. Um, what was the next thing I was going to say about that is that <laughs> is, is the... Well, your team was getting tight by the, then. The time, well, we're starting, to, we're starting to get ready. Yeah. Uh, this, is in, this is in October and... Uh, that's pretty much where we were at that point. George disappeared again. So we didn't, all, uh, then I got real familiar with Marble Mountain because the team, we couldn't run, George was gone. So we ended up pulling security duty. I'm uh, like, you'd go on for a week and you'd be off for a week. For a week? For a week. Oh. So we go for a week and really it was kind of a blessing because you didn't, you didn't have Charlie Vickers or somebody running around <laughs> saying, what are you doing? But we would run our own patrols up on the top of the mountain, and, and that's where we discovered the caves and the different things that were up there. And again, Marble Mountain, there are several peaks, I forget how many, but there's a couple underneath which the uh, Viet Cong had prepared for the, uh, at least a year before they attacked on August 23rd, 68. You're, you're right. There were still communist elements residual there. We never realized, or at least I didn't, yeah. in terms of retelling the story that under Marble Mountain, there were caves, trails, several levels yes. of uh, activity. And so you're there, and now you're patrolling, and you're learning more about the inner workings of Marble Mountain, yes. which was um, a sanctuary yes. for the communists that were right next to FOB4, our base that had just been attacked with the, one of the most historic, devastating attacks in our history. Yes. And then years later, I'll, I'll, I'll just throw this out and we can come back to it later sure. but but I went back to Vietnam with a couple of my friends and uh, we went back this is like eight nine ten years ago we went back and we hit the mountain and at the base of that mountain uh, there was a village selling marble all kinds of pieces and I met uh, a young girl at the, everywhere I went on that trip and we went all the way up to Hanoi, and we went all the way over to Sante and things like that. But as I came back down, I would ask people, do you know anybody who was in the North Vietnamese Army that were you know, fighting for your country? And I had not ran, had that, had a positive experience until I got to Marble Mountain. And the girl said, sure, I do. I said, really? Yeah. I said, well, who is it? She said, my grandfather. Hold it. And her English was better than mine, far better. Oh, yeah. And she, was, uh, she looked like she was about 16, 17 years old. And I said, well, is there any chance that, you know, we could meet? And she said, sure. And so she said, but you have to talk to this lady here first. And this other lady was sitting there talking. Her English not quite as good, but her, her mission was to sell me this big piece of marble, which had three dolphins swimming out of it. It must weigh a thousand pounds, and it's it stands about five feet tall, 
and I know my wife, okay, <laughs> Miss Donna, would love that. So I said, well, I'd like to buy that. And so that got me through the door to get to the guy that was her grandfather. Whoa. So she, she says, okay, with well, this. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come back tomorrow. She said, oh, no, by tonight. I said, no, I'll be back tomorrow. And then we'll go. I will, the next day I went out, okay, while, yeah. we're, while we're up there, and I'm, I've, I've jumped way ahead. But basically what's going to happen is I'm going to tell you about the story about the commander that I met, who was the grandfather of that young Vietnamese girl who was in the mountain the night of the attack. And wow. I've got a picture of that, okay? Sure. Of, of, of these guys. They've got letters hanging down to here, you know. Oh, all, yeah. All, all, yeah. So, anyway, I'll let you take a command of the lead here again and go for yeah, it. Yeah, well, you're, you're there on Marble Mountain. This is one of your chores. And then at some point, uh, you had the mission, you had to go in to the caves? I did. That was that was a time when uh, it was just right about the very first part of November, and we were getting we were getting pot shots from the mountain uh, that faced on the north side, uh, and we're getting shots. They had sniper shots that were shooting into the camp. And when you're up on the camp, we get probed all the time, and uh, they'd probe. They'd come up and and they'd find out where, where we had our, our early warning devices, claymores, thing. and sometimes you'd find it had been cut or it had been moved, okay? Or turned around. Or turned around, exactly. And so we had, we had heard, and so we went on one of our patrols, we went down the bottom and we found uh, on the south side of the mountain, okay, which is uh, a place where there's a lot of entrances, but they, they, the Vietnamese camouflaged it. Like they'd build a house right up against it, and it was a place that they would. You could open a bin like this. This table that's yeah. in front of us, they would open a bin, and in that bin there would be rice and things like it. And they go, "Well, that's a nice rice." And Bacon had come back when he said, "No, let me show you something." He lifted it up, and it was all kinds. It was grenades. It was all kinds of stuff. It was inside the thing. So George knew. It was yeah. It was. It was. And I was holy smoke. So then that gave me the incentive. And I think George might have been with us on this one. We were the first one that we went into. And, and, uh, and George would have been a better tunnel, right, because he was a lot skinnier than I was. <laughs> and, uh, but he said, no, go on. I said, you can do it. You can do it. I said, okay. So I went in. and So you out. went into a tunnel. I went into a tunnel. It started out a fairly large, about, Opening. Three quarter opening, and then of course it gets down smaller and smaller and smaller. And as you get into this thing. And wait a minute, you went in with a hand grenade, a I'm, flashlight, and. A 45. A 45. Okay, yep. so I just want to get that straight. That's right, that's right. And uh, two hand grenades, by the way. Oh, two. Oh, oh you're yeah. heavily armed. Okay. Well, if the first one didn't work, I was going to make sure I had something to fix, try to get me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, we, we were, you'd, you'd move in and you'd crawl and you'd look and you'd. We had red lens, and if you've ever been in the woods and you take a white light and you try to walk through, about the only thing you see in the woods is wherever that white light is at. And so we would we would sit there and we'd get adjusted, and and the things that I did learn in AIT training, right, as to how you would do, you know, the visual purple in your eye, as to how you would adjust. And so we would do it. But what we ended up doing with this this little interpreter. Uh, I apologize to him and to you and to this audience. I can't remember, remember his name, so I called him Lee. And it was it, it might have been close to that, but I called him Lee. Close enough for government work. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I watched you guys tear it up in the King Bee thing the other day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, <clears throat> I, I would get with him, and he would turn around to me, and we were close enough there was all – your signals, your hand and arm signals were, oh, sure. were, were almost touch. And he would you know, put his hand on his mouth and he'd be quiet and listen. And then he'd touch his nose. What he wanted me to do was to smell. We could, we could after I got used to it, it took me about 10 or 15 minutes, and I, I could then smell where they had been cooking, where they had been smoking, and they were probably no further than 15, 20 feet away from me from where we were. Now, at this point, that tightened me up a little bit. No kidding. Yeah, that tightened me up. 
because oh, I'm thinking I can't, a little bit. I can't just jump up and run, right? I, uh, and I'm, if I'm crawdadding backwards, you know. Can when, you crawl backwards at a I, high rate of speed? Uh, no, no, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> then, or especially now, but I, I sit there and uh, I. I go, oh man, this is something. So we went back and we made some notes and we passed it off uh, to the S3 section. And I said, this is this is what we think is is going to happen, and uh, this is what we smell. Is and so, but of course, when they finally get how they want to, they want to. Next thing they want to do is go in, and they want to gas all those tunnels. Okay. So the next time I went in, I went in with a gas mask, and they were thinking, all right, so. Yeah, I, I, you're young and dumb and, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And so I thought, well, but I got in there, and I had that gas mask, and I had to get rid of one of the grenades so I could get the gas mask on one side. I said, okay, now what if they gas this thing, okay? And I'm first of all, I, gotta, I, gotta, I was in a position where you had probably about no more than four or five inches above your head. So you had to take, clear that, put that on, clear that mask, Okay. And so you're carrying the gas mask in yeah. your official government issued gas mask holder. That's it. Which had one or two buttons on it. You had to open the lid, yes. pull it out, get it configured, and then strap it over your head. Yes. And they wanted you to do that in a tunnel. They did. They okay, did. very good. Just so, want to clarify. <laughs> so they, they were talking about they were going to take at one end of it, and they were going to flood these tunnels with gas. And so I, I kept getting these visions of, of <laughs> rolling waves of gas, like water waves coming in through there. And then I could also see uh, mad, crazy animals, because we heard there were animals inside these things. Yeah. You know, all kinds, everything from tigers to to, to giant kawandas or whatever the heck it was in there. Not to mention dogs. <laughs> no, no, dogs, forget about that. Yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> so, but we got in, and thank goodness they they somebody from the higher command dispelled that uh they said no we don't we don't want the buddhist uh monks we don't want them to fall out on the ground above the gas rises up so we came out and i i was very them so that was my two tunnel rat stories that i have for you oh my god <laughs> was, is, was that during a period of time where they also had talked about maybe trying to blow the mountain up you the marines had oh, talked about and they were going to strap together like a hundred yards yes of blocks of c4 yes tow it in and try to blow up the entire mountain uh, that's it is that you, during you, your you, reign of you, terror yes yeah you remember that that happened <clears throat> uh about december the 12th through the 15th somewhere in that time frame and we had a young lieutenant that was killed up on the mountain. And since I'd had a lot of experience on the mountain, I was one of the guys that was <laughs> You're asked, the Marble Mountain the, Man. The Marble Mountain Man. <laughs> like Marlboro Man, but I'm the Marble Mountain Man. <laughs> so they, what they asked was, is they, can, can you go over here and, and do these types of things and help? And we said, sure, we, we would do all of that. And somehow the, the, the news media got word of this the Mar marble mountain was starting to become a kind of a popular area for things to be happening and the news media walter cronkite types were somehow uh. showed up they showed up with their cameras and and uh after several uh, discussions close and personal they decided to leave right and we had that fob one where for a while there um at the bar in the morning or at breakfast, the joke was, okay, today, whose turn is it to chase away the reporters? <laughs> <laughs> Snoopy ass reporters. And yeah. they would usually be given a choice. You can leave or die. That's right. Most of them left. <laughs> <laughs> Even a reporter could figure yeah. that out. And, and that was what happened that day up on the mountain. <laughs> and so we were trying to, run to bring this, this body down. Well, what had happened was is that our commander was so angry with the fact that he had lost a guy right there on the mountain and he and this uh, third Amtrak commander uh, they had uh, maybe gotten together and you know saluted Indeed. saluted our, our dead but the, what ended up happening is that this third Amtrak commander had called somebody from the big Air Force base up on the hill there in Da Nang and uh, 
they pulled in two deuce and a halves, and off these deuce and a halves, these these Marines folded out their demolition teams, and they pulled these things, and it looked like a rope that was about two inches wide that connected these blocks of C4 that looked like they were two feet by two feet square. Whoa. And it was, it, I, I, to me, it looked like it went a mile, but I would say easy 100 yards. They got, they was coming off of that truck, and they were lining it up in 10-foot sections, okay? And what they were going to do, they said, all right, Big O, we want you to show us where you can take this in and put this stuff. Into the tunnel. Into the tunnels. I said, huh, okay. I said, but you understand, there's somebody, There's only room for either it or oh, you. Man. And I said, I'm not staying in that tunnel with that, I can tell you that. <laughs> well, they, we, they did. They got some into it, the, and their whole objective was, was to blow this mountain apart, period. Oh. And <laughs> I never heard that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, and so, again, the, the, the higher powers to be somewhere from the mayor of Da Nang to uh, McAvee headquarters in Saigon, but the word got back. Stop your madness. Yeah, this ixnay some, on that. That's right. Yeah. No more. <laughs> so we all came out of that, and that's that's the story on the on the blow the marble mountain down. Oh my God, yeah. I've never heard that. Yeah, I love it. So yeah. moving on. So yeah. at some point, did you remain on Sidewinder? I knew you got assigned to a hatchet force. At some I point. did. I did. I got. I got. Uh, I kind of got wounded up on the mountain. Okay. And thank wounded God, during I wanted, a small well, firefight, uh, sniper. There was a, it was a firefight that night. Came down. They had reversed a couple things on us, and I came down uh, one side of it. And there was a small, uh, kind of like a toe popper type of thing. It blew uh, myself and a big chunk of rock off the side of the mountain. Down I went about 25 feet and landed. Oh my God! And oh yeah. And so the little people were looking at me, and, and they got, oh, buku kilo. Yeah. <laughs> or as the little people would call me, cone trowel, which is water buffalo. <laughs> and so I said, oh, okay. And so they, anyway, but uh, I finally got, one of the medics got down, stopped the bleeding, or at least put the pressure on it. Yeah. And then they got a king bee to come in there to, and I'm thankful for this day that. Oh my God, is yeah, that right? The king bee took me off the mountain and <clears throat> took me up yeah. to China Beach and all that sort of thing. And so I was, I was very happy. Then. And uh, they wanted to take and send me back to Japan and all the way. And I said, no, I'm going, if I'm going anywhere, I'm going back to the FOB. Sure. So I've stayed in convalescence up there four or five days. And then they brought me back down. I was in my recon hut with Bacon, who was gone again. Okay. And Sanderford Allen Jones. And Sandy, For some reason, I remember seeing you at that time. Yeah. When you were doing a recoup, regroup. Yep, yep. I don't know why. Or maybe that was when we came to that. Well, by that time, was it January? January. Or 69? Yep, yep. So we closed FOB1. Yep. Our team, our RT Virginia came down. And there you were. So, okay, now it's coming together. Yep. So I'm I'm now trying to get back into I, – I, I, yeah, Bacon is gone. Nobody, yeah. nobody knows where he's at. <laughs> and I said, "This is it now." Now I'm an experienced guy, right? From tunnel, tunnel, tunnel rats to the Marble Mountain man. And I said, "I need to get on here." So I tried to uh, strap hang with some guys, Dave Mauer, and Dave Mauer said, "You know, I love you, man. You're a good guy. You know what you're doing." But blah blah blah. He said, "But you're just too damn big." <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and he said, "My little people don't want nothing to do with you." <laughs> Oh no! I said, "All right." Robbie Robinson is it the same thing. Yeah, and it went on, and, and uh, so then I left from there, and I went up to the hatchet. I gave up the position. I passed on the team to Bob Bobby Schrag. Oh, okay. And Bobby sure. Schrag took over RT Sidewinder. I went to uh, the hatchet force, and from the hatchet force, we ran a couple of BDA missions. And that's we, for a bomb damage bomb assessment. Bomb damage, right? Which again. Yeah. You know, the theory is our Air Force go, we'll bomb them, and everybody on the ground is going to be dazed and confused. We just want you recon guys, just go take a couple pictures, tell yeah. us how the bomb damage was, and all the the, the enemy troops will be dazed and confused. They won't bother you. Yeah. Nothing further from the truth. When you land, there's some pissed off NVA oh, troops oh, there. Oh, let me tell you that they were... <laughs> 
they came out of the holes like rabid dogs. No. You know? oh, yeah. <laughs> now, the, thank God their aim was off because they were probably still dazzled dazed, dazed you know. Okay, so at least they were dazed and they, not confused. Exactly. But they were shooting, and they were mad. And, oh, and my uh, God. a couple of the birds, one bird took, uh, took an RPG, in the in the belly it didn't and uh, but this he was still in, insertion bird insertion we're right yes. we're coming in and uh so we a couple of us jumped out we grabbed uh we grabbed one of them and i think he was dead by the time we, he got back uh, <laughs> but <laughs> and we got it threw him in you know he was probably poor some snuffy had no value of intel at all <laughs> and a couple of guys but the, but what it basically got shot out uh got the team, really the, yeah the 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 Chinooks is what we flew in on. Oh, and uh, okay. So that when we went in, and as the weather was closing in on top of us as well. Oh no! So air support was limited, and so that was that. And then the next BDA we went in on too. We we didn't go in for about a week later, and it was uh, as accurate as the boys were with the bombs. I think it was the next valley over. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even anywhere close where they put us. Oh, no. So we stayed on the ground for four or five days and, and uh, finally came out. And and then uh, after that, I ended up going. I had an opportunity to uh, to go over and to, uh, to fly WeatherFact and to be a radio operator over at Nikon Phenom. Indeed. And, and to help with uh, bright lights and stuff like that. Sure. And Nikon Phenom was in Thailand. Yes, it was an operational base for the 46th Special Forces Group. Yes. And what they couldn't talk about was the SOG operation that went on there. So anybody that came in that was attached to SOG, when the, when the plane with no markings would land, yep. an Air Force truck with no, no markings, markings would back up to it. You get in, and when we were there, they yep. had it had a curtain that closed. So yep. if anybody looked through the driver's window, you couldn't see. Yep. The doors would close. Take us over to... Uh, to the uh, SOG headquarters there. Yep. Of course, I had some kind of other innocuous sign that just said something. I forget what it was. But yeah, yeah. then we come in. And so welcome to uh, the yeah. SOG base in Thailand. And you did some weather R&R. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and not R&R. &R, I mean weather missions. Right. Oh, sorry, I misspoke. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Oh. So then I spent the time there and I did some weather fact and I did the other things. And we did a couple of... Uh, uh, couple of bright lights and uh, I helped a couple of the medics go and pick the teams up and whoever was coming out but none of them uh, the guys that had been wounded would have been the little people uh, they they're the ones that got hurt uh, but the Americans that were on the team they were okay and so that the so the, but the, you had the, to do a bright light so you had you were on a bright light you were strap hanging on a bright light to go in and help a team that had been wounded. well I, I say bright light uh, it was more of a medevac, and I went in to help the medevac. Okay, the, so you're the chase yeah, medic. I was just, well, a chase half medic. There you go. Now you got it. <laughs> I was actually helping a chase full medic. Indeed. But uh, but we went in. We went in on the Jolly Greens, and right. so, so when they came in, to, uh, they had more air assets at NKP uh, than they did at uh, other parts of uh, across the fence back. Particularly when the weather was socked in, so it, nothing could launch from Vietnam, yes, and yes. you're and launching from NKP or Udon, Uborn, was the only way in. That's right. To get to our people on the ground. Yeah. And so you're a part of that. Yeah. Wow. So, I uh, I was fortunate enough to be there, uh, when the when the men landed on the moon. Right. And, now was that? Now was July sixty nine. I, I was. They had the radio on, and we all came in, and and uh, you know we had a glass of water, Coke, beer, whatever it was we had, and we tipped our glasses and thought that was the coolest thing since sliced bread. So indeed, yeah, and fairly much that was the the tour uh, for Vietnam. I, I packed all that up and came back, and yeah. Uh, Went on with your life. Yeah, well, what went on, and uh, went back to college and finished that, and, and then went to uh, uh, became. I was part of an uh, or uh, excuse me. Before I went into thing, I was part of in in junior college, boys right. junior college. I had I was part of the one sixteenth ordinance in Idaho, and <laughs> that, yeah, I was the national guard unit. 
And and then of course my dad said I told him I said I'm joining I'm, I've had it I said as soon as I'm finished with school I'm going to go in. He said no, whatever you do don't go airborne and don't go to special forces. And I said <laughs> oh okay. I had met a recruiter already by that time out there and this guy, super guy and uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway long story made short there I, I ended up I ended up going back to school there, um, and then in '73 I I went I I was. Inactive reserve, active reserve. Right. And then I... For a total of six uh, years of service. Exactly. And then I went back in 73. I went back on active duty again. And I was trying to get back to Vietnam, but they were shutting it down. Right. And I said, oh, man. So you went back to active duty Uh, where? uh, I went, well, this is a funny story. uh, Of course. That ties into spider parks. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Well, I, I ended up going to Fort Ord. And in Fort Ord, what I ended up in Fort Ord was that because there's a special uh, replacement company that takes active duty guys and came back in. Well, I came back in at the original rank I got out as, as an E5. Mm-hmm. And they said, we're, we're going to take and put you in a program that is that is being stand up right now for, for guys like yourself. And we're going to take and we're going to send you A, to a OCS, or B, we can send you to a new special warrant program that's being developed. I said, okay. So when I got the Ford Ord, everything was lost. Nobody even knew anything about any of my records or nothing. And I swear, I stayed in a holding company. And I'm down there, and I thought, man, what's going on here? You know, so yeah, I, yeah. I tried to see the commander. No, 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 nothing here. Just go on back, settle down. I said, you got a choice. Either you can get out, we we'll give you a discharge, you can go wherever you want to do, or you can wait. I said, right, well, I'm not doing much. I'll just get in shape. So I ended up doing that, started running and doing some things like that. And so they thought, why don't you just, why don't you just go back through basic training again? No. I, I said, wait a minute. You try to tell me. They said, yeah, that's it. I said, what the hell? Well, I'm back to basic training again, okay? Now I'm in basic training. Now, these guys found out that I was who I was. And they said, oh, okay, well, we need some instructors. And we... And they found out, oh, have you ever shot the law? I said, yeah, a couple times. <laughs> they said, well, why don't you be our peer law instructor out on the range? Here I am sitting here in basic training. I, but this time I was running this platoon that I had. The, the, no. the, the instructors had walked away. And you're the only guy with a CIB on. Well, I didn't have anything. I was still sterile. I was clandestine at that point. <laughs> okay. but, that, but some people knew who I was. Sure, okay? yeah, yeah. And so then... It was about the second or third third week, I think, into it. The instructors would come to me and say, "Hey, why don't you come with us and let's play some football?" Oh, I said, "Really?" I said, "Yeah, we we hear that you played football in college." I said, "Yeah." I said, "Okay." So I'm out there at night. Okay, day I'm with the guys. At night I go back in. I said, "What about the guys? Don't worry about that. We'll have CQ. We'll keep an eye on them for you." (laughs) I'm out there playing football. And then I'm lined up, I'm on the defense, and I'm sitting there, I'm digging in, I'm getting ready to, to go after the quarterback, and I hear this voice. At quarterback. Spider Parks. Oh, my God. Spider was out at the Presidio going through language school. Right. And, he, and he's out there playing football. And I stood up and I said, you sure are a pretty mother. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he looks and he goes, they go, oh, what are you doing here with no hair? <laughs> So I told him everything. Yeah. And I've got a picture of this that you should see it. All anyway, right. I graduated about another week or so after that. And uh, they 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 came out. And so Spider walks out. I didn't have, I still didn't have any orders. Spider walks out on a parade field, takes off that hat, has me my beret. Okay. He said, this is it. And he says, first chance you get, get some boots on and blouse them. I said, okay. He was an E7 then. Yeah. And. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And I got a picture of us standing there side by side. Now I've got my stuff on my chest, right? Oh, and yeah. Everything, yeah. And so after that, I said, well, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen as far as me getting back to Bragg. He said, oh, you mean this set of orders right here? No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So I, they, sent, they sent me. I already got 5th Group, 3rd Battalion back in there, and I showed up and I reported in. Wow. Yeah, that's it. And by that time, 5th Group was back at Bragg. Back at Bragg. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. And so 
Then we did a, a few quick things, and I just got on a, the same perpetual motion of a recon man, and uh, everything was moving very rapidly. I was, I was, I got assigned to scuba school, graduated, came back. So how long was scuba school back then? I think it was like six weeks. And of course, the, what one of the unknown, least publicized aspects of Special Forces Green Beret training is scuba school. Yes. Because that school is tough. Yeah. In fact, I knew that. And besides medical training, I knew that scuba school with my bad ears is one place I never wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> so you down there, you graduated. I, so I graduated. just give us a little bit of a feel what that scuba school is like, what they put you through in terms of oh. trying to drown you as part of your training. Oh, they do. They, they, and they enjoy it, too. Indeed. Oh, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I, I think they were rejects from the Navy course or something because of the instructors, <laughs> you know, so... Some old seals down there for yeah, good luck just to see it, if you knew how to, exactly. if you were serious about your training. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they, they push you pretty hard. And oh, yeah. They've had long hours, night training, night swimming, uh, and it just it, and runs, long runs, uh, 12, 15-mile runs, and uh, long swims, 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 swims. And uh, probably one of the better – conditioning that I was by the time I finished that. It, sure. was, it was very good. Now, is, during, is any part of that training include submarine training? Not there. Introduction. So no, what, it, did, it did not. That's so your next they, phase. They, that's right. That's that's the next thing. And the, the, they actually mentioned it, and they talk about, you know, hyperbaric chambers and how you, you do your those types of things. They mentioned that, and but as you... And your interest them, was... Tweaked. Oh yes, oh, oh, yes. I was man. I was on that fast track. I was sure, going. absolutely. They they get back to brag, and then uh, next thing I know, uh, there is no NCO in the scuba locker, and guess where I went? For fifth group. For fifth group at Fort Bragg. Okay. Yes, at Fort Bragg. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm in there and I'm looking at all that. I said, well, first of all, you need equipment. So the next thing I know, I'm out in California. At U.S. Divers Headquarters, okay, out here. Yeah. Okay. Buying new equipment. Then I go to AMF Voight. Uh, I, I, I meet some legendary Navy guys, SEALs, and get that were sure. working for AMF Voight at that time. Uh, Jocko will probably know a few of the names when I mention them to him. Indeed. But um, when that, I came back. And when I came back, then um, they, they said, well, we need somebody for preschool. And I said, well. I am a dive instructor, you know, civilian. They said, oh, okay. Well, why don't you do the pre-scuba? That way we won't lose you to Key West. So <laughs> I, I should have known then that, that my, my, my latitude, okay, yeah. was limited as to which way I could go, left or right. I said, okay. So then we started doing pre-scuba. And then off the pre-scuba, somebody said, oh, you were in Germany. So the... I said, yeah. I said, did you ever go down in Bavaria? I said, yeah. I said, I used to swim all the time down in Kimsay, I'd say. You know, Bob said, oh, really? Oh, you speak German. And I, I paused and I went, well, let's just, the, I learned from my Gabriel days to limit, uh, you know, that. I said, well, I, I can say hello and goodbye. And maybe I can order a beer. They go, perfect. You're just the man we need for our scout swimming program. <laughs> I happened to meet one of the legendary scout swimmers from Sweden, Barney Nilsson. And Barney Nilsson was in the movie The Green Beret, and he was on the uh, on the Gabriel team that they, they demoed that were all actually Green Berets in, in that movie. Barney and I became good friends, and Barney came over and, and, and worked with me, and we set up the scout swimming program. And all of a sudden now I became a guru in scout swimming. Oh okay. my God. Now when you so, say scout, this is like the scout in the military sense of going out for a recon, early pre-mission recon. In this case, it would be aqua. Yes. Related to water type right. recon as a scout. Imagine this, if I am, you will. I'm this, is, this is a twilight zone thing. Imagine that you walk up to the edge of water and you're looking out at the ocean and it's flat calm. Indeed. And yet you look out there and you see some debris floating in that water. And it, it's just, maybe it's, it's seaweed, maybe it's whatever. And then you see some air bubbles, perhaps? This no is before the new no, rebreathers? No, it, this, these guys are scout swimmers. 
they will come in and they will do what's known as a horizon insertion. Indeed. They will come in where you're like about three to four miles offshore, uh-huh. off three or four miles now. Miles. And they will, they will exit the craft and they will swim in, not making one bit of ripple. And as they get in and they'll, they'll time it with the tides, and as they get close to where they're going to do, the tides will drift them right into shore. Really? And they're, and they're camoed up. Sure. They may have seaweed that they can collect along the way, or they'll look like a floating log, any number of things, but that is the Scout Swimmer program. No kidding. But let me tell you something. If you've laid in that water as long as I have, like 12, 14 hours, whoo, you're, you're like a prune coming out of a jar. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So but welcome to the scout program. Oh, yeah. So now I had some experience in that. And then all of a sudden, the, the locker wasn't busy enough with scout swimming and scuba. But then I inherited, okay, Yeah. the rubber boats, the, R, the RB-15s. Indeed. And the motors that went with it. I said, oh, okay. Well, I knew a little bit about boats, and I know a little bit about motors. But I didn't know enough about what I needed to know. <laughs> so one of the commanders came in and says, well, why don't you try to fix that? I said, well, I would if I could. And I could if I knew what to do and if I had the right tools. They said, well, where do you need that? I said, I need to go to school. I said, okay. So I got on a set of orders. I show up in Waukegan, Illinois, which is where the Johnson Outboard Motor School is. That's, right. That was our 35 horses at that time. Uh-huh. I show up there, and stand and behold is the legendary, the infamous, okay? Yes, indeed. Walt Shoemate. No. Walt and I went through <laughs> Johnson Outboard Motor School and Stevens Electronics course advanced, okay? Yeah. I won't go into the particulars of this, but let me tell you, there's a reason Walt Shoemate is a legend. Indeed. That's right. <laughs> and he, he showed the old young guy how to drink a beer. <laughs> <laughs> we had and a good time. We came back from that. And, then and just the, give us a little bit of Walt's history prior to your running into him there. Yeah. Because he had been in Nam several tours, at least one was SOG. Yes. And, of course, he was of legend in, in our the uh, scuba training programs and the combat diver programs later. Yes. And this is your meeting him there. At in the capacity that I was in. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. So we, be, we became friends, and uh, the the next thing after that when I came back is that uh, it wasn't busy enough yet in the, <laughs> in the locker, so they said, well, the battalion is now going to go, and we're going to do some winter warfare training. Oh. Well, when I first came back, and something I left out just a moment ago, when I first came back, all right? Yeah. I was assigned through 3rd Battalion to go to Camp Drum, New York. Ooh. I was a winter warfare instructor because somebody had heard that when I was in college in Idaho that I had been on the ski patrol. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, well, that's great. You're just the man we're looking for. Well, I had, although I've skied and I was fairly proficient at it, I had never seen White Star skis that long and made of wood. And oh no! You're wearing the yeah, and wearing the the big white jungle boots or not jungle, but jungle, yeah. uh, jungle bunny winter boots. Yes, big white insulated Arctic boots. Yeah, you know, that that you would wear. So, anyway, when I got that, <laughs> I got that. I did all that, and so in in that training, I got up there and I got familiar with it again and, and mastered it pretty quick. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, the 82nd Airborne Division shows up. I am their primary instructor, okay? A young E5, sitting there looking at these guys. And so I said, okay. <laughs> but the first thing I'm going to they got them all lined up. I said, the first thing I'm going to do, I said, I want you to all, okay? I showed them how to turn, walk in their skies, turn around, and face in that direction. When they did, I walked around. I said, now, any time that I can get the snow out of your eyes, you can see me a little bit better. So... <laughs> That statement, and that statement alone, there was two generals in that class in that thing. Really? And I had letter upon letter upon letter of recommendation, okay? 
that came down through the channels. And I'm trying to think of the general of, of the center at that time. And if somebody can remember his name. Well, he wasn't as good as you were. So anyways. Well, anyway, he, what, he, what they did is said, hey, this, this guy's walk on water, winter warfare instructor. No. Uh, oh, yeah. So now, <laughs> I've now I've, I am now, okay, the winter warfare instructor. And also, whatever whatever skis that we had with Fifth Special Forces, I had no idea that that was part of our AO, our, our assignment. I'm now getting all this old school stuff that's in there from Chippewa boots. That now, oh, you know about Chippewa? Well, good. Now you'll become the mountaineering instructor as well. What? So I had pitons and hammers and and, and climbing and ropes and you name it. I had it. I was doing that, and I was saying to somebody earlier, and I said, you know, out of 365 days in a year, yeah. I was gone 360. <laughs> I was gone. I mean, TDY, you name it. Oh, my God. And so from that, um, we, we started doing, uh, going back to a question you had asked earlier about, Submarines. Yes, that was that was asked, your, right? your old water locker details. Right, right. Well, uh, I said, okay, we need somebody to go with us to help set this thing up. And since you're the guy that seems to have a little bit more about the and what RB fifteen, and what you're going to set up was what submarine training. Yes, submarine oh. training. So I said, okay. So we ended up going with, and the go-to team at that time was was uh, a. Uh, a team sergeant, legendary, Sante Raider, Jakovinko. Oh, of course. Jakovinko. So since I had an MOS, that uh, had two SF, well, two and a half uh, <laughs> MOSs, <laughs> he didn't have a scuba person, okay, on his team, okay, but he needed one. His team was a scuba team. So every now and then I'd get the bidding to go with him. Well, they were a high-speed team. And there's no nonsense, Sergeant. Oh no, Blaine. no, it's it, it's dead on. He was one kick-ass Sergeant. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, and him and uh, there was always competition. Andre Smith is another one that was in there. Andre had another team, and then all the teams would be competing. Well, anytime somebody needed something, that had a, they needed an Echo, okay, right, or a Bravo, which I was also, or a half of a, half a medic, medic, I got assigned to. Him. I was TD. I was the strap hanger for that group. Oh my so, God. Um, so in this case, you're getting ready for some serious submarine training, of which you knew serious. little at that time. Yeah, but go yeah. on, Ron. Yeah, it was it was it was amazing time, uh, and I kept thinking it'd be easier if I just could go back to recon company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Uh. So we did we did a lot of winter warfare training. We did some stuff out in Idaho and Alaska and Eskimo scout teams and. But then you did get back. Don't walk away from the submarine training. Oh oh yeah well, please, uh, um, yeah we did. We 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 got we got to do that type of training and. So by to, then were you still dealing with diesels or by that point were you beginning to phase in your training with upgraded submarines up to nuclear perhaps? Oh uh, uh, good point. We decommissioned. Uh, we went to Key West to do the training on the last diesel submarine at that point in time. Right. And we took it out and, and we dove it and we took it down to Guantanamo Bay. And uh, we got out there and we did some uh, underwater explosive training with it and some horrendous looking pictures I'll show you sometime. But they, when we did that, we, we decommissioned that submarine and doing lock-in, lock-outs. Uh, putting rubber boats out and all that type of thing. And the uh, that submarine, and I can't remember the, what that sail was, the name. I, it'll come to me, I'm sure. Yeah. It, was, it was the last one decommissioned, and our government sold it to the Falkland government. And when the Falkland War broke out, the British sank it. Either by accident or personal, I don't know what happened. But that submarine <laughs> is at the bottom of the sea down there someplace. The uh, Admiral of the British Royalty. Just, exactly. This thing is so old, it's not even of use to us, but you guys train on it. Wasn't yeah. there an aspect to the uh, the old diesel sub that you preferred over the more modern subs today? Well, there or was, is, for us, larger than average 
Oh, indeed. Scuba guys, okay. <laughs> that that old diesel sub trunk was much bigger. Okay. Yeah, you could get you could easily get five guys inside that and still be tight, but still. And for our listeners that are not familiar with either Army or Navy water issues, the trunk is. That is the lockout chamber. There we go. Uh, imagine climbing into uh, a round washer through the hole, and then getting five, you know. Uh, five guys inside that completing your breathing apparatus. That's right. Well, there's the, it comes out of out of the wall of of that little washing machine, and you're inside there, and then there's one big hole that's like 30 inches in diameter that leads out to the open ocean, and uh, so when you when you get inside this, then they'll shut the main hatch or they'll dog the hatch as they right. say. And when they do that, they'll open the blow, which is okay, which allows some pressure, air pressure inside it, but then they'll flood the trunk. And when they flood the trunk, that kind of tightens you up a little bit because now the water is now rising up, rising up at your chest. Now it's up to your chin. Now it's right up to the bottom of your lip. And then and you're sucking oxygen or air from that, a little tube? Just a little tube. You sit there, a little, little regulator. You put that in your mouth. And, and now you, the breathing amazingly gets <laughs> a lot quicker. You know, that, As a pucker factor. That's tightens. a pucker factor, that's right. Indeed. And so <laughs> they then they then will take the they'll flood the trunk. It's <clears> up <throat> above your head. And above that that round thirty inch tube, uh, that's what they're doing is they're gonna equalize the inside pressure to the outside pressure. Whoa. They'll open that pressure up. Okay. The tube opens and it kind of looks like something you've seen in the movie. The guys go in that tube, and you come out the other tube, and now you're in the old diesel subs. You were below deck. Mm-hmm. They, they had a superstructure above that. So you would get out there, and you'd get everybody together, and then from that point, uh, you could take and put your gear on. Usually it was— And the open. gear was strapped to the deck? It's strapped to the deck. Yeah. And then you would reach up, and you'd grab it and put it on and, and uh, through all the training. And then you would either— uh, come to the surface or stay stay with as the as the submarine is moving in a forward but it always has to be moving as it's moving in the forward position you would swim on the trunk line that would go to the top of that and if you're going to ex- exit you'd have to go up because you can't go up too fast uh, and you would get up close to the top where the, the periscope you know would normally break water right at that point on a certain signal we would break free left and right of the con, and it would pass right in front of you. I'm really? Gonna, I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing, nothing so amazing as that trunk passing past you, one half of the team's on one side, the other half of the team's on the other, and as they go past you, we're in crystal clear water that is bluer than blue. Wow. And as that, as that submarine goes back, solid black, right behind that, okay, yeah. great big con, it's a big, beautiful American flag moving underwater. No. Oh, my God. It is, it sends, How cool is to that? This, to this moment, it sends chills up by it. Yeah. I, yeah, I can't Unbelie- imagine. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Wow. And then I watched at that particular moment. I was in awe. And then I heard a clunk. And one of the guys had his knife had fallen out of, out of his scabbard on his leg. And you could watch the glint of the, of the sun as it hit the blade as it disappeared into 2,000 feet of water. It just disappeared. Forever. Disappeared. But then you looked up and realized, wow, I'm really out here in the ocean. And then you looked <laughs> around, and then you looked up, and in a very, very close proximity was a school of about 25 hammerheads. No. Yeah. But first you just look. It's like a fire truck. Yeah. You go, holy smoke, it's a... And, and then you go, and then the curiosity, then you want to go over and swim with them, you know, for whatever reason. Oh, with hammerheads. But the, Oh, yeah, with hammerheads. Yes, oh, hang okay. out with the hammerheads. But hammerhead sharks, hammerhead to be exact. Sh- exactly. <laughs> and so, anyway, that, that's, that's, my, that's my submarine story. Now, the submarine story for the nuclear submarine, Yeah. a lot tighter, smaller trunk, okay? And when this open tube when it opens it opens into the open ocean okay Mm -hmm. so when you come out of that you better have your faculties together and be able to come in they have a a line that runs along 
and you either have to snap into it or get a real good grip on it so you can come back uh, and then put your gear on uh, while you're underwater. Most wow. of those, most of those you know, that we did, uh, we would go out of like Groton, Connecticut, and you'd go out to sea, and you'd link up with a destroyer, and that would be you know or some type of big type of sure. battleship like that, or I'm probably saying all the things the crews. You guys will probably just hit me upside the head when Jocko gets here. What well, are boats? They're big they're boats. boats. They're big yeah, boats. They're very yeah, big. Right. Some have guns, some don't. That's right. Some yeah, have, yeah, yeah. These didn't have sails, so I can tell you that. So, but, <laughs> Marine uh, Corps Transportation Service. That's right. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and in case we get some Green Berets sneaking in yeah, there for a little right. training. Exactly. So by this time, would that be official combat diver training? Yes, that's right. And that all of that, they'd go through extensive training. And then they'd go through extensive what they call trunk training. Uh, the trunk training would be towers, uh, escape towers, where you would lock out at the bottom of 100 feet, and then you would have to ascend to the surface on a single breath of air. And in 100 feet of and water? And 100 feet. No. And, what about bends? No. No, there's no bends. Oh, can you guys pressurize? Not, that's not allowed. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hope. <laughs> but, but what they do is that when they take that uh, as you ascend, that you would go back up. And yeah. The, the on one the, breath. On one breath, and you take a breath, and then you'll go back up. Uh, and then there's safety divers that stay with the, the diver as he makes his ascend, and goes up. And they can do that once. Then they also have something called the sinky. We used to be called the sinky hoods. It's a hood that goes over your head. Mm -hmm. And they would do this from a little bit deeper uh, water and a, in a little bit colder type of climate. And it's an escape mechanism that they would say, ho, ho, ho. And that would be like blow and go, but this is ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Not to be confused. The single, yeah. <laughs> and uh, don't, don't get it confused, whatever you Indeed. do. Indeed. Yeah. Oh, my God. But that's, that is the, the extent of those two types of submarines that I've had exposure to and working with. And my, my position in the dive lockers, the NCOIC, of, of, of that facility. So while you're doing mountain training and other winter right. training, right? you're still, okay. Yeah, so I was still sure there. I I, yeah, that's right, I yeah, would come okay, back. Very good. And, and in the meantime, <laughs> I was trying to train up some trainers, right? <laughs> I, <laughs> I need help. help, I need help. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, we did, and we, we did some really cool stuff. Uh, the s skiing. Uh, I ended up later on. I became uh, involved with Natick Laboratories, and Natick Laboratories. We designed uh, one of the very. I'm jumping from submarines to snow skiing now. Indeed. And we designed one of the very first new 180 centimeter skis that was designed for mountaineering with Chippewa boots or a boot that would be similar to Chippewa. That would be more upper collar so you could do more downhill type skiing as opposed to cross country. Right. We're that way you could do both? You could do both. And we were designing bindings at that time that would have the heel lift capability that, could, that you could do your skating with uh, as far as the, you know, the kick and glide. That's what they talked about. Right, because the, the winter training is so critical because there's so many areas of operations around the world yes. where winter training is a critical element. Yes. That we have to train and be able to train indigenous troops mm -hmm. how to mountaineer, prepare for war, and self-defense. Yes. But that's all part of this training, which is yes. so different from being underwater. I know. But and you're, I, you're there. I, well, what's State so of the art at the time. Well, you know, from the Marble Mountain Man, uh, became <laughs> <laughs> here I am. That's I'll a long do, swim, brother. Oh, it's a long swim. It really <laughs> is. It is. I was, I was fortunate, though, to be part of these things and then make it. But the theater of operation would be 10th group that you would think as far as the winter warfare. Right. And the types of things that they would do. But we, And they had been involved in the Cold War for the, years the, and out of Germany. Yes, exactly. They had to be ready for anything across the fence behind enemy lines in yeah. the mountains. Yes. And that's, you know, I was fortunate to have some – little bit of input uh, to help out for whatever little teams there was some some teams that were they would then start becoming ad hoc to a 10th group team for example right in the theater of operation 
And I think you see a lot more of that now, like in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, where teams from the third group, uh, their AO might be Africa, for example, but yet you'll see them in South America. Or you see guys from the seventh group, and there might be South America, Central America, but you might have seen them in well, the Pacific Well, during the 20-year war, every group that used to have special areas in the world, yeah. all of which were trend through either Afghanistan or Iraq at one time. There you go. Same and thing. And meanwhile, they had their, still their basic jurisdiction or country that each group was attached to, like I said, Africa, South America, yeah. Asia. Indeed. Wow. So in, our, in my story of back to now. Yes, indeed. Okay, all right. Um, I think that, that I've, I've been very fortunate uh, to have been with uh, the men, okay, of yesteryear, okay, my SOG brother. Indeed. And, uh, and then as I moved forward um, into what was happening, I, I ended up going into the civilian side of everything which would be into the Department of Energy and Department of Defense. So what would be your time frame, Ron, on that? Oh, let's see. If you survive basic training for the second time, <laughs> yeah. you go in, you do your mountain training out of the water locker. Uh, exactly. Yes, well, thank yes. you. I, I, I guess I need to put closure <laughs> to that, don't I? I, I? I think that was wrapped up about 1981, and then I rotated out of that uh, and rotated over to uh, – the civilian side of the house, okay? Right. And my dad uh, was then Is working. Is he still living in Idaho? It, no. No, my dad actually, my dad's retired, uh, military, and uh, World War II guy, vet, fought in the Aleutians and stuff like that. And he's the one that told me, don't go airborne. Don't go SF. Don't, don't go SF. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we we ended up in, so he, I said, well, he said, what do you want to do? I said, I'm not really sure. He said, well, why don't you come up and work with me? He says, and I'll get you a job at Sharon Harris Nuclear Power Plant. Whoa. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, he said, uh, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. Let's, let's start out with something simple. So he said, well, why don't you just be a labor? I said, okay. Well, somehow it's like, you know, learn, becoming a, a ski guru. I said, somebody said, oh, this guy's got some leadership skills here. We're going to make you a foreman. Okay, <laughs> so well, I became a labor foreman, and then I ended up becoming a labor superintendent. And then uh, they they said, okay, well, we need you in some training capacity because I see you've got background in training. So we're going to send you over to uh, a brand-new stand-up, we're going to stand this operation up as the largest aluminum rolling mill, okay, in the world. And you're going to be the training manager slash director for, this, for Daniels International. Okay, it's like yeah. Brown and Root or Daniel, but Daniels International. I said, okay. So they send me over there, and it's in Russellville, Kentucky, okay, which is just up from, what's that little place in Kentucky with the Ford in it? Oh, so, Campbell. something with Campbell Soup yeah, or something like it. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> I went up there, and we stood that up, okay, and we stood that up and got that all done, and very, very – successful program well, excuse my total ignorance but why would they need a big security program for aluminum rolling well it, it was i could see where you can bring that in but <laughs> i i was not in the security capacity at that time oh, okay no this was just uh, as a director of training okay to stand up these things so what i did was is to set up the stand up the programs and they had something called BEST, B-E-S-T. It's Basic Entry Skills Training. Okay. And in that, uh, they had all of their crafts. They had uh, welding. They had plumbing. They had uh, uh, carpentry. Blueprint. Yep. Okay. They had carpentry. Sure. Uh, they had uh, they had steel. Uh, Anything you could build with. And, well, it, anything, heavy-duty construction. Sure. And so what we did is we went in and we set the thing up as to where it would be similar to what an A-team would do. You'd go into a country, you get the people, you recruit them, you train them in the different skill sets. And that's what I did. I just managed that wow. and set them up. Yeah. Did very well. Uh, I became a colonel at that point. And I think that's where I was trying to 
Yeah, to let you know, I said, Colonel I'm, I'm, and the National Guard. Oh no, no, hell no! Fifth this, this is, I am uh, a Kentucky Colonel. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. With or without chicken? Oh, uh, without chicken. Oh, okay. Uh, this is, yeah. But <laughs> an honorary position that they gave to indeed. people that, that did some things. And I so, forget about the Kentucky tradition. Oh yes, that's yes, indeed. Right. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, they uh, Colonel Owens does have a nice ring to it, though. It does. It does. <laughs> But my wife won't recognize it, you know. Indeed. But, uh, I, I think that what happened was there with the the training as we developed from there, which will tie back into the security, was that they needed some assistance in an, another part of the world called the Middle East. And so at that point, they wanted somebody to come over to help so them. So now we're into the 90s. Uh, yes, we're into the 90s. Yes, sir. And Thank you. And so now they wanted to... Uh, they wanted somebody to come over and help establish a training program, which would be kind of like a train the trainer program. And that program would be to replace expats in a country. And by doing so, what they ended up doing was that they took the individuals uh, that were in country, say for example, you were in there working in right. security or you were in there working as a superintendent of of uh, building tables, whatever the, whatever the job may be. And my job would be to take one of the Saudis or the, the Yemen or, or whoever it may be of Arabic or wh whatever nationality they may be, but uh, they wanted us to train them to take that place of the expat, the American or, sure. the, or the British or whoever it may be. So here you are in the desert, we're well, in you the had desert. a great opportunity with all your winter mountain training yep. and your combat diver training in the desert. Yes. Oh, very good. I just want to make sure but, that's clear. But as you will see, <laughs> the gap closes. As it closed, oh, oh, yes. Oh. Well, the first big assignment was in a place called, uh, oh, well, I'm having a moment here. I'll get, I'll get it's in the it. Middle East, so you're moving on. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. But Saudi Arabia, right around there. Yes, yes. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, and the, the name will come here in just a second. But what, what ends up happening was, is that as I go into this country, we set it up, and re, uh, there's Riyadh, uh, which is on the one side. And, uh, almost, almost had it. And by this time, Desert Storm, Desert Shield had already passed. No. They have not. That was just as before that. Okay. Right. So while I'm there, we're setting up these pro programs. Uh, they are in a position of looking at water uh, filtration plants, uh, and the company is called De La Salle. De La Salle is is a is a German company, and what they want to do is they want to translate from German to English and English to Arabic. Okay. And we have to take him and put that into a format of training. And that's everything from teaching someone from the basic as a, okay, right. or, or a regular guy, just like I did when I went to work at the Sharon Harris nuclear plant, all the way up to an engineer type. So my job was to develop the training programs for that. And then I tra helped translate from one language to another. And if it became too difficult, then obviously I would either go to the internet or I would I would hire uh, an advanced interpreter to sit down and work with us. Well, the internet was still kind of new then. Yes, but most of these places had pretty good size internets. Okay. Okay. Because it was right. developed at the corporate when, level. Uh, right. Yeah. And I don't so much as think of it as internet at that point like we know it today. Correct. It, it was more uh, it was more machines that had so much uh, so much data that you could go back and, and it would refer a lot like internet as we think of it, but but slower, okay, uh, along those yes. lines, and a lot and, bigger machines. A lot, oh yes, much bigger, <laughs> a lot bigger. I um, I apologize for not being able to remember the name. It, it, it it's the largest city in Saudi Arabia, and uh, it's right on the coast. Uh, that's right. It's a big city, Saudi Arabia. We're moving right on. Oh, story. yeah, yeah. So anyway, we, we got there. Uh, and then after that, 
uh, that job ended. Um, then I came back, and the uh, what was what year was that? Somewhere in the nineties, I think. Yeah, because uh, by that time, then there was Desert Storm, Desert right. Shield, the invasion of Kuwait. Yeah, I was I wasn't in the country when that happened. But it all happened, so it helps you with the time frames. You well, move they, yeah. because also you've had over your lifetime, you've kept some of your relations with the scuba diving training down in the Florida Keys. Well, I, I did, and in addition to that, I also while I was there working all in your spare well, time. Well, I got Jetta. Yeah, that's I was it. in Jetta. I should have known. No, me too. <laughs> but with, while we were there, uh, I met several different uh, contractors that were there and also uh, people that wanted scuba diving training. So I said, well, if you can get me some equipment. They said, well, we know just the guy. And so they take me downtown. Okay, right. And there's a guy. He's Arabic. And he goes, yes. And he said, you teach? I said, yes. So for, this is what he said. Here's the keys to the shop. You can run it. Just when you're done, he says, come back. He says, whatever money you make, just put it in this can over here and don't worry about it. Really? I mean, I had talked to him that long. <laughs> I didn't. I don't even know his name. He didn't know my name, but he knew that I was the sorry. I had my card. That's my card. Yeah. Oh, he was so excited that there was somebody there that could teach so I started teaching when I wasn't working during the day, yeah. doing the normal things I was doing. I would go there and teach at night. I made more money at night than I made <laughs> on the contract that I was working <laughs> over there. Unbelievable. The uh, the German airline company, uh, I can't think of the name of that right now, the, the biggest one that they've got. But they had they had little hubs inside of Saudi Arabia, and you would live in these compounds. Mm -hmm. And I would go, they had their own pools, they had everything. You just go in there and you'd teach. And the only thing that you couldn't do, really, in the country, you had to be very careful, was drinking. You couldn't be caught drinking. Oh, my. So, being the clandestine guy that I am and going back and falling in. Indeed. Somebody found out, one of those German guys found out that I knew something about boats, that I knew something about motors, that I knew something about diving. And also found out that I was in Special Forces. And he said, I ah. need you to help me. I said, okay. So why not we go out on the coast, <laughs> south of Jeddah, okay? Yes. This is, this is getting kind of scary. Indeed. We get out there. All of a sudden, a boat appears. <coughs> the guys get off, put the boat. It's already got the motor on the back of it. He said, all right, get in. Where are we going? I said, don't worry about it. I'll show you when we get there. Off the shore we go. Well, about two miles, okay? Yeah. He's got a dip finder. He says, what do you think? I said, well, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of a knolls coming up. It's about 60, 70 feet. He said, perfect. He said, do you think we can catch up with an anchor? I said, well, yeah, possibly. I said, if one of us gets in and goes down, he said, we can put the anchor on it. Okay. So he tells this guy, he says, Tell me when you want him to go into work. So he's drifting. I said, now, in the water he goes, down, he hooks up, he comes back up the thing, so we're hooked. Now, we're we're into about three knots, four knots of current. So that, that boat is starting to plane up a little bit on the nose. Yeah. So I'm thinking, oh, this is good. Maybe we're just going to do some spear fishing at night, okay? Yeah. But I didn't see any spear guns. <laughs> I saw a bunch of bags and stuff like that. So we're sitting there, sitting there. So I, he said, just relax, okay? So it's going to be a few minutes. He says, I'll tell you what's happening in a couple of minutes. I said, okay. <laughs> You're always the last to off, know. Off in the distance, <laughs> I can hear this. It's getting really? louder. Yeah. yeah. And it, it is a freighter that's coming. A freighter? A freighter. This freighter's coming straight. He's got some secret light. He's blinking, you know. That's, that's that thing. sounded more like a tugboat. Yes, yeah. yes. But it, was, but, but it wasn't. It, it, <laughs> I think it was the cylinder, a one-cylinder type of thing. And he's coming. Uh, this guy's flashing the light. He's all right. Everybody get your gear on. We'll get ready. I was like, okay. So that's it. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And this thing, oh, shit, this thing will run over the top of us. Here comes this thing. He comes within about 20 feet of us. As he goes by, 
off the side of this thing comes a great big Connex container. Boom, down it goes. <laughs> All right, let's go get it. <coughs> go get what? What the hell's going on? Come on, you can do it. Down we go. It's got these bags that you put fish in and things. Yeah, yeah. We get down to the bottom. It opens these doors up. It's full of liquor. Oh, my God. Full of liquor. So we load this thing up. Back we go. Okay. He's got to make about like shit. 15 trips to go back out to this to thing. To get it all. Oh, yeah, to get it all. Wow. So I gets back there, and he says, all right. He says, I'm glad you were here. You really helped out. He says, he says, you take a bottle of this and take that home with you. And he says, we'll get together, and I'll, I'll give you something else very special, you know, in a day or two. I said, great. I said, but don't call me in a day or two. I said, I was never here. Okay. <laughs> Because if you get caught with any kind of liquor over there, Ooh. oh, they can chop your hands off. They can get oh, all, yeah. oh, yeah, they, it was not pretty. So that kind of clandestine operation kind of moved itself into a back to now type of thing. Yes, indeed. Yes. And then after, <laughs> after that, I came back, okay? Yes. And the contract that ended over there. And so then I was notified by my good friends in Special Forces that they needed some help. And that was up in Idaho to stand up the very first Idaho Energy National Laboratory SWAT team anti-terrorist slash, no kidding. slash 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 yeah very first one. Wow. So off to Idaho I went, and uh, <laughs> I link up with a couple guys that were former Delta operators. Okay, yeah. and of course you know the guy that. You, the seal guy you know yeah he'll want to know watch him he'll i guarantee you he'll be able to take a right shit down yeah what, what's his name what's his... <laughs> <laughs> anyway we stood up the very first team uh we developed the program for him up in idaho uh -huh. and uh that was it and so it was back to now again because john and i had been on the same teams back at bragg yeah okay and John had went on to Delta and stood it up, uh, so it was it was it was good. There's another guy, uh, Wade Ishimoto, that's inside this thing here. He oh, and John were close friends. Yes. Okay. So the circle that I ran in was never ending. It was always touching, all the way around from Vietnam to where we are right now. Indeed. So I did I did the thing. I stood that up. We did the program. Uh, we had everything. We had our own helicopter, Bell, brand new, Bell 222. Really? We, we, we had all MP5s. We had all high speed. Uh, we had Browning Howe powers, all brand new. Uh, all of our vests, handmade. We had sores that would come in. There. Everything that we did was new. Our program was new. And the Department of Energy sponsored every bit of it. And it was highly, highly classified. Not sure. Unlike, not unlike SOG. Indeed. So, anyway, it was it was a very interesting and a, a, a very great time um, as far as the development of an individual from then to where we are. I stayed in that program uh, up until they we put the final class through and graduated. Great group of individuals. Very, very good. And so there was job offers out on the market for me at this time within the Department of Energy circle. And I said goodbye to everybody, and my bride and I went back to Florida. But in route, okay, in route, in route, we were coming right down through Las Vegas, and it just so happened that one of the contractors that was in, he said, "Why don't you come out here and work for me for a few days?" He uh, said, "We'll put you up in a hotel here." I said, "Okay." So we went out to the Nevada test site and we did some work out there, and it was it was good. Then they tried to hire me to come to their, uh, where's John Wayne Airport at? In uh, Ur Ur Orange County. Orange County. Yes. In Orange County, their, their headquarters. Uh, they were the former chief of police and SWAT team commanders for LAPD. Wow. And, uh, and so we became good friends. I, I became really good friends with their, one of their, their guys named Ron Corbin. Uh, Oh, sure. I remember meeting you, You Ron. did, yeah. 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 And uh, I have a book for you he's going to give to you. All right. That's okay. And uh, he's, uh, 
he's quite the guy. He's quite the guy. But I mean, we, we became good friends, and over the years we would work at different places. And from there, from Florida, I went back and I would work Lawrence Livermore, uh, Savannah River, uh, and then we worked the Department of Energy petroleum sites from New Orleans all the way over to Brownsville, Texas, all the stuff that's buried in the ground. Wow. We developed their, their protection program for there and trained their guys with that. Uh, and that, that went on for almost 10 years. And then all of a sudden, it was decided by the higher people that we don't have a terrorist problem. We don't have a, we don't have a threat. But really what was happening was is that they were unable to get their heads wrapped around well, the, from the political standpoint, they were not able to grasp the direction that they really needed to go in, which was, you know, a better threat assessment, the better types of things that we would do. So, so what that, year is this? This is all before 9-11? This is before 9-11. I was working with that group again, and I was up in New York City. Uh, and I became, from the Marble Mountain Man, I became a Wall Street wizard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we no. were we were doing threat assessments for all of the the high speed uh, different uh, Drexel, Burnham, and Lambert, uh, Citicorp, Citibank, all the investment uh, groups right. that that are in there on Wall Street, and we worked with them to come in to find what type of. Uh, shortages that they had, what type of uh, shortages in, in, in the sense of did they have enough training, did they have the right security, did they have the right security cameras, did they have the right kind of doors, did they have listening devices, did they have ways to detect if their offices were bugged. <clears throat> Excuse me. Indeed. I had the opportunity to work with some of the brightest and best of all of, of our national agencies. We had two station chiefs that I had I had worked with. I had State Department guys that I was working with, and all of them had all vast experience. So I, again, was on a fast track uh, moving in the yeah. direction where we're going. Um, we worked that for a long period of time as well. And then again, at the very end of this one contract, we were asked to come over to uh, a thing called the Twin Towers. No. And we were asked to take a look at the, the guy in the station chief wanted me and about six others to come in and look at their physical security and take a look at just, just a cursory. We weren't getting paid for it. We just volunteered it. We yeah. said, sure, we'd be happy to. We had done very well financially for the, for the things that we were there. And what was interesting about this is that as we went into it, it became so blatantly obvious that these were the problems that we picked out. So we hand wrote on a piece of paper those types of things and we handed it to them. We didn't spend any more than six hours doing the whole thing. It didn't take that long, okay? Oh yeah, this is before they had the first bombing in, um, the, in um, the garage? Uh, you stand, you're right on it. Whoa. I, it was two days. No. Two days, we left. Get I, out. I was back in North Carolina, it happened. I like to fill out. I picked up the phone and called this guy who had hired me to do yeah. that. And he said, Big O, he said, let me tell you something. That Because it was, came out of our playbook. We picked, hand-picked, everything plus some, a lot more, that they could have done. And one of them was to do exactly what they did. Exactly. No. Yeah. And so what ended up happening was is that now we have – you know, you know the background. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. So, uh, 